Hello folks, welcome back to World War II TV. I have not been streaming for three days and it's been nice to have a bit of a break, but here we are back with another week, a bit more than a week of kind of random shows. There's no real connecting theme to the shows that are coming your way over the next few days, except they will be interesting. That's the connecting theme, although this one does kind of connect with a show we have on the 30th of this month when Mark Turner is coming back to do part three of his US military crime uh, set of shows with us about how the American uh, military dealt with their capital crimes and other crimes in World War II. But today we are looking at the British. And my guest today, Paul Johnson, he's a military and aviation author, a part-time tour guide. He's been on TV. He's done all sorts of things. And recently he's turned his attention to these graves uh, that are he will talk about in this presentation. Just before we bring him in, I want to remind you, if you are new to the channel or if you're not new to the channel, please don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to like the videos you watch and don't forget to share what you're doing. we're doing on social media. I'll remind you, the links to all my guests' books are always in the description below. So Paul's book is in the description below. So uh, that's where you can find it. But we're going to bring him in now to talk about the Brookwood Killers. So good evening, Paul. How are you doing? Paul Johnson, how are you? Hi, how are you, Paul? I'm well, thank you. And uh, hello to both you and to all of your viewers. Good. So me. you've you've done a few books. You've been around the block. You've done a few things. This yep. is, is going into a slightly new area in the sense that it's about military history, but it's about social history. It's about crime and what have you. But before we get into the presentation, how did you discover the story? Was it one that you found out years ago and took ages to write the book, or was it a relatively recent discovery? It was something I found about uh, years ago, really, when I was doing research at the time into war crimes, um, so military war crimes, particularly, funny enough, in the, in the Normandy region. Um, and I discovered, just by chance, uh, a, some files in the wrong place. Um, and these were murder files uh, regarding soldiers who had committed a civil crime uh, of murder. Of course, that sparked my interest started to look into it a bit further and was completely surprised about what I found. Eventually, of course, I established uh, that there were a number of soldiers whose names were recorded on the Brookwood Memorial uh, in Surrey. Um, uh, another historian, Andy Saunders, uh, was, had been doing some work on it at the time as well and uh, had done a presentation. Um, and I looked a bit further, uh, more deeply into it and discovered that uh, uh, there were some heinous crimes um, committed. Uh, these guys' names have been recorded by the CWGC um, in perpetuity. And, and so I decided to investigate further and uh, uh, write up my findings. And the results are your book. And one of the things that is, I think, a, a commonly held myth is that during a situation such as a war is that crime suddenly stops. There's this idea that people leave their doors open and there's a spirit. And of course that exists. There was a spirit, there was a blitz spirit in Britain, but, but crime continues, you know, murders still happen. Uh, other crimes, theft still happens. And it's, it's something that we don't think of kind of normal life carrying on. I'm not saying murder is normal folks. I'm saying it's, an, it's something that we deal with, all the time, but it does carry on during the, during the war. Even though a country is supposedly galvanised for the war effort, people are still bad. I guess is the is the the bottom line there. And, and that's what I'm really. Yeah, you know, the propaganda was saying everybody's you know all pulling together. We're all together as one. Everything's wonderful. You know, we know we're suffering with rationing, etc. But to, you know, you know, there's a massive community spirit, and of course there was. However, normal everyday life continued and that of course includes normal everyday crimes and in fact they began to escalate with not only black market crimes but military-based crimes as well where you arms ammunition clothing were being stolen sold on um you know and an influx of course of um, commonwealth and allied troops as the war progressed uh, and as a consequence Crime rates went up and up and up. Yeah, and you know they're just a mix of people, just lots of people in a very stressful environment. I mean, if we look at the early part of the war, it's not certain that the British are going to to come out on top, and people are worried. They're stressed. There's 
there's there's and there's opportunity when when there are stressed people and there are bombed out buildings there's opportunities to, for for crime to come anyway we go off talking about the the, the the social situation in great britain in world war ii but i guess that's what we are talking about but you've come armed with a powerpoint presentation and we'll fire that up now and folks what we'll do is we will do questions at the end of today we'll we'll let paul do his presentation or i will jump in with the odd comment here and there and we'll do questions at the end so i urge you of course right at the beginning is that what we're going to get from Paul tonight is only obviously going to be a potted, abbreviated version of these stories. If you want the full gory details, I guess the, 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 the solution is to go out there and buy the book. So again, I remind you that the links to buy the book are in the description below, or you can buy it whatever your local bookstop is of your choice. But I'm going to hand over to Paul now for this presentation. And just when you need me to move on slides, just say next slide. So off, over to you, Paul. Lovely. Thanks, Paul. And uh, welcome, everybody. So the book will kill us, a short talk, uh, and it, hopefully it will be relatively short, uh, is about the 20 uh, men whose names are recorded on the Brookwood Memorial uh, who were executed uh, for the crime of murder uh, and one for the crime of treachery. Um, so if you just pop on to the next slide, Paul, you'll see that uh, who's talking at you tonight is me, Paul Johnson. Uh, unfortunately quite a common name so there's lots of us there's another historian that i know of, paul johnson he's a tad older than i am um i'm a military historian um, aviation historian and written numerous books or several books um, about aviation history uh, and more recently uh, uh, in the conjunction with my colleague dan hill from the hearts of war project uh, and also uh, the, the recent book with killers done work for the bbc itv Member of the Guild of uh, an associate member of the Guild of Battlefield Guides, not a badged member, um, and uh, uh, as I say I'm the historian for the Hearts of War project, for all of, you know, which gobbles up loads of time, and all of which I love. And of course, there's also you know, my my own research work, uh, and this is a fascination that's come, that came out as I said earlier, from when I was uh, researching war crimes, and found out a little bit about civil crimes committed by soldiers uh, and so we went on from there so if we move on to the next slide this is what the presentation on the book is really all about these are the victims so very very briefly up there in the top corner is mark turner he was 82 years old the oldest of the victims uh, the smaller uh, waf picture is marguerite uh, burge who was murdered by a, a canadian and left to die overnight the killer returned on that one. Uh, she was still alive and left her for a second time. Um, the fourth little uh, picture is a, a lady called uh, Joyce Jakes, who, uh, in my opinion, looks very similar to Claire Balding. Um, mm. And uh, um, she was uh, strangled by her um, well, sort of boyfriend uh, in the far to top right is uh, Annette Pepper um, and of course you know, she was murdered by a Canadian and I'll, I'll tell you about that as we go along. In the bottom right uh, is uh, it's, uh, Joe uh, forgotten her name uh, Joe Rayner sorry, so Joe Rayner um, she was murdered by a Burmese husband the next smaller picture Pearl Wolf uh, murdered again by a Canadian the smaller picture in the middle there um, is a, a lady uh, whose name is uh, um, um, Maggie Smile. Uh, and then, of course, we, uh, the picture on the bottom left uh, is Gladys Appleton. Those in the middles are the WAF. Some of you may recognise is Iris Dealey. On the far right is Lily Austin. And in the midi middle is Kitty Lyons. Now, only the WAFs uh, are, are recorded by the CWGC. And in the bottom right corner, um, Joe Rayner, who was an ATS member, is also recorded by the CWGC. All the other victims were civilians. And of course, their names were not recorded. And it's about them, really, that, 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 that the book circulates around. You know, these guys, the murderers, and if we uh, carry on to the, to, to the next slide, uh, we will come to them uh, shortly, were members of the armed forces. Um, their names are recorded in perpetuity. Crime in Britain during the uh, Second World War 
were, was pretty prevalent, really. Uh, as we discussed earlier, yes, there was a community spirit. We perhaps sometimes over romanticize uh, the Second World War in some way, um, yeah, as, as with the Great War. And we do that as historians very often when we follow a trail, we follow a formation, you know, down to regimental battalion level, down to, you know, to company level, we'll visit the grave. Um, and we somewhat romanticize and we don't look beyond that, really, what was going on around it. And who are these guys? Because we'll go to a, a cemetery, we'll find you know, the grave of many, many soldiers who killed in action, died of their wounds, injuries, illness, etc. But there are also those there who were murdered and there are so amongst them murderers. Mm. The bottom line, of course, is that any force, whether it's an army or an air force or a navy, is made up of individuals. Some of them brave, you know, individuals. Lots of them just ordinary service people trying to do the best job that they can. And, of course, there's bad apples and bad pennies amongst all of them. You know, and, and their life experiences really sort of changed or went with them, was carried with them. In the Great War, we saw a, a, a great rush of volunteers at the beginning of the Great War. Not the, not the case in the Second World War, because conscription came in immediately. There was lots of men pushed into the armed forces who were a little bit disgruntled, didn't really want to be there. Uh, and their behaviours, you know, were in some cases bad. And there was this explosive mix also. You've got youthful testosterone. Yeah, You've got estrangement. You know, we're away from home. We can do what we want to do. And, of course, there's a mixture of alcohol, and the availability, in many cases, of female company. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, just a lot of that. Second, Paul, just is, I'm glad you, first of all, I'm glad you, we talked about the victims first, because that's the, that's how it should be these days, that it, when, when it, we get excited by reading about the horrific crimes of, of even modern serial killers, but actually it's the victims that we ought to pay a sympathy to. And another thing, and I'll let back, get back to you is, is that I have as a guide in Normandy, you know, when people say things, they go to so much, they, oh, they were all heroes. And you don't want to say, well, no, they weren't. Because most of them, most of them were. But people get killed in accidents. People get people might have been running away. They might have been cowardly when they were killed. I mean, I'm talking in, in, in rare, rarer cases, the majority of them are, are going to be heroes. But it's a label that is not really very nuanced. It, the, well, what, I, I, I don't know. Been, Sorry, I don't know about you, Paul, but but certainly for the, all the veterans I've ever met, you know, they dislike the term hero. Yeah. And they quite often will say to you, the only hero is lying there in the ground. You know, not me. I was just doing my job or the best job that I could. And I'm sure, and, and that's something I probably want to, would want to get over tonight, really, is this is a small minority of servicemen. Yeah. Uh, but I do have some details at the end that sort of opens up the whole question. Um, this this particular case, very tiny, tiny minority. So this was not all, all servicemen were like this. But, you know, we have to face up to our history, whether it's military or social, warts and all. You know, yeah, we, you know, we weren't, didn't behave in the most appropriate way across the centuries and you know and, and during this the first world war second world war men did things that they weren't proud of you know and other men did things because they've been brought up that way yeah so uh, um but certainly you know there there was a great opportunity you know dances pubs cafes many, many hundreds of thousands of men and women in uniform, you know, there was this sort of an excitement going on. And in amongst that were these individuals who were looking, you know, alcohol driven sometimes, looking for a fight, looking to for sex, looking, you know, to get you know, to release their energies. And also, of course, they were bored. Some of those men and, and women join up, 
I'm going to go to the front and we're going to kill Germans. No, no, you're not. You're going to be sent off to some camp in Northumberland, you know, where you are going to be drilled until the end of your life. Well, that's what it's going to feel like. You know, it's going to be pouring and rain. Miserable environment. You know, people that you work, that you're with, actually, I don't really like some of them. And I want to get away from it. So mm. for some, of course, desertion became an issue. And again, uh, as we go along, uh, uh, we'll, we'll cover that off. So if we go to the next slide, um, commemoration, really. So these three gentlemen may or may not be known to some of your viewers. So Charles Koopman here on the left, uh, he was hung, sorry, hanged, because the people of our, uh, uh, made some issues about me using the word hung. Uh, so he was executed uh, for murdering his ex-girlfriend and her small baby child in front of his wife. And we'd been in the RAF for just two weeks. Um, he was executed in civilian uniform, uh, in civilian clothing, and they're not in uniform. So he didn't disgrace the king's uniform, uh, and therefore he's not commemorated by the CWGC. In the middle. The Blitz Ripper, the Gordon Cummings, uh, believed, well, some people think he's one of the first serial killers. Probably not true. Uh, but he certainly did uh, murder a number of prostitutes uh, and he was executed for his crime. Again, he was executed in civilian clothing, so not commemorated by the CWGC. And on the right, Harold Hill, he's a child killer. He was executed at Oxford, uh, the only one to be executed at Oxford jail uh, throughout the Second World War. Um, and he's of interest to me in as much as he, at the time, he was serving uh, with the Hertfordshire Yeomanry, the 86th uh, Field Regiment, Hertfordshire Yeomanry, uh, and Hertfordshire, of course, is my home county. Um, none of these commemorated by the CWGC, and by the way, CWGC do an absolutely tremendous job in my eyes. Uh, mm. But, you know, there are, even within their own archives, uh, a few issues that, 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 that I certainly have and that, that, that I'll raise as we go along. So these men are not commemorated. So if we go to the next slide, these individuals, however, are commemorated. So these are the men some of the men who you will find on the Brookwood Memorial. So down here on the bottom left uh, is a chap called Austin. Uh, now, um, certainly, uh, as, as far as he goes, well, he's a Fred Austin. He's a, a, a wife killer. Uh, in the top right, uh, top left, sorry, is Walter Clayton, who uh, is, was the uh, Morecambe Strangler. Uh, next to him is a Canadian who is, uh, um, is uh, um, uh, his name is McEwen, sorry. Uh, he's the guy who killed the 82-year-old uh, postman, Mark, or former postman, Mark Turner. Uh, right here in the middle is, uh, uh, is uh, Charles Rayner, uh, and then next to him is Charles Gautier. Underneath him is August Sangre, and on the right here is Ernest Kemp. They all look like any photo that you would see of a serviceman during the Second World War. No one's got killer tattooed on their head. Uh, their crimes were pretty awful uh, and involved murder, in some cases murder and rape. Um, Kemp, uh, we'll touch on as, as we go along, is a particular... Uh, interest. Gautier, he is certainly uh, um, probably the saddest case uh, in here. Um, and uh, um, Raymond, sorry, Charles Raymond, he's the one right in the middle. Uh, he's pretty brutal uh, killer. McEwen at the top who killed the postman, he's probably amongst the most brutal of all the killers that you'll find on Brookwood. Uh, uh, Walter Clayton, who just come back from Burma, um, was a victim probably of his own service. Uh, and Austin, who in the bottom left there, looks probably the most demure of them all, really, was just an all round pretty nasty individual. Yeah. Uh, 
but all these men are commemorated on the Brookwood Memorial. And of course, you know, other much braver individuals, such as Violette Zabo, have got their names recorded on this memorial. Now, Violette Zabo's own daughter said that these men should not have their names recorded in perpetuity. It's something that I certainly would agree with. Um, uh, but the CWGC is stuck purely and simply because with the Royal Air Force, the Royal Navy, anybody who committed a uh, civil crime such as murder and was executed would be executed in civilian clothing. And therefore, they're not recorded by the CWGC. The Army and the War Office, very haphazard approach. Uh, and a lot of it seems to centre around the supply of a civilian suit. If they supplied the suit, the individual was executed in the suit, didn't disgrace the king's uniform, and therefore there's no grave, no representation for them whatsoever. But if they weren't supplied a suit in time, then they were hung in their uniform. And the uniform would be stripped of any badges, uh, but they would still be in uniform. And therefore, they are entitled to be commemorated. The CWGC, if it's stuck with that, really, you know, it's, not, it's not their problem. It's not their fault. It's the war office, where you just didn't get these, the clothing to the prison on time or in sufficient time for them to, be, to change into it. Um, so as a consequence... There we are. Well, the, these these men, and there are other uh, examples of that uh, outside of the UK, uh, of course, men who are executed for civilian uh, civilian murders um, were executed in their uniform, and so they have a CWGC headstone, uh, and there are quite a number of them. Um, so it, it, I think people are quite often surprised by that that actually when we go into a cemetery, all these, as you termed it before, they, these are all heroes. They, they, these all these men died in combat. No, they didn't. Some were executed. And uh, one, and I don't want to digress too much, was a, uh, was a Royal Naval fireman uh, on a ship. And he was, when he was executed, um, uh, right, the execution, right, the officer in charge was uh, uh, asked to give the coup de grace, which he did. Uh, and when he gave the critical, the sailor looked up and said to him, bad shot, and it had to be done again. So he had to be given the coup de grace for the second time. However, we are digressing. So these, some of these are just, well, these are just some of the individuals. If we go on to the next slide, Paul. Um, just to interrupt for a second, it, 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 people are already on the sidebar. They're talking about the fact that, so it comes down to whether or not a civilian suit could be, got to the prison in time that is the criteria and yeah. um, people are obviously wondering why there isn't a better set of rules in place within the military to offset this kind of problem but i guess i'm thinking about it laterally it's it's we we should be grateful that the situation wasn't common enough for there have to have been a precedent set up it was obviously very very rare and so therefore there wasn't there wasn't some kind of set, uh, you know, scheme in place, but this is how we will deal with it, so they can be, you know, dismissed from the military or something, then buried. As a, it's it's so rare that there's, there's this paperwork weirdness is there. Of course, and you know, there's a war going on. The war office are consumed with running the war. You know, yeah. suddenly someone saying. Do you think you could pop a suit down to Dorchester so that we could execute a soldier? Well, it just didn't happen, you know, for whatever reason. Um, you know, and, the, and within the files that you'll find, you know, it's all in the, in the public domain, within the files that you'll find uh, in the National Archives, you know, there's a letter from the governor going, look, hurry up and supply a suit, or else I'm going to hang this guy in his uniform. Well, they didn't supply the suit, so he got... He was executed in the uh, in the in his uniform. Wow. There you go. There's a problem handed straight over to the CWGC, and you know, under their charter, what can they do? They, they they've got to memorialise this person. You know, 
And it has already come up in the sidebar. Whatever they've done, they are still somebody's son. They are still a, a, a citizen of the UK. They are, they are, or whatever, Carl Canada, whatever dominions they are. They are, I guess, entitled to some kind of the same right as everybody else, despite what their 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 deeds were. It's a, as we said, yes, we sure. don't we don't separate in a cemetery those who who didn't perform their job brilliantly compared to those who were who ran ahead and knocked out machine guns and earned the victoria cross they all get the same grave so yes it's, it's raising lots of questions this it's fascinating it really is fascinating okay so so you know, very briefly and we look at a couple of cases the first of which david uh, uh private david miller jennings he, he was from a, a small village called chopwell in northumberland um uh, he was serving with first battalion south lengths he was um uh, serving in France, 1940, evacuated at Dunkirk. They, they take them back and they are at the Maraboot Barracks in Dorchester. Uh, now, suddenly he's gone from being in France, being in action, the whole, you know, surviving Dunkirk, to suddenly being back square bashing in, in Dorchester, you know. And so, uh, you know, they're waiting around, basically waiting to be sent overseas. Um, and what do they do? Like all soldiers, the Sunday night, they go out drinking, you know, on the way back, uh, they go, uh, they pop into a local cafe, they have, you know, a pie and a cup of tea and whatever. Everything's very merry. They go back to the barracks and uh, uh, Jennings says, I'm going back out. Uh, I'm going out on a break. In other words, he's going out to do a burglary. His mates try and stop him. No, that wasn't. He forced his way out. He's carrying a 303 rifle and a pocket full of rounds. He goes back into town, into the uh, to the army recruiting center, where he breaks in uh, and starts blasting away with his rifle at a, a safe that's held there. And you know, understandably, 303 rounds won't penetrate the safe. Uh, splinters from the safe spray into his face. He gets cuts on his face. He gives up that. He goes across the road and he enters the Nafi, which short um, short circuit in the story, really. Basically, he'd robbed the place the night uh, before, on Saturday night, he'd robbed it. Uh, that's where he got his beer money for Sunday night, so he's gone back there. But Albert Edward Farley, uh, 65 years old, served in the Great War, wanted to do his bit in the Second World War, his first night as a uh, uh, fire watcher. And his first night as night watchman in the Naffy, the Dorchester Naffy. Now, the manageress of the Naffy had put this guy in place because they'd been robbed the night before, but she didn't tell the police that. She mm. didn't tell the police they'd been robbed. So um, Albert Farley was in there. Jennings uh, breaks in thinking he's going to steal the cash from the cash box like he did the night before. Farley challenges him and he, he makes a run for it Jennings now he's still drunk he's been firing his rifle uh, in the um, army recruiting office so he starts blasting away at the door he said to try and scare Jennings instead he strikes him fairly and squarely in the chest and kills him outright he then with blood pouring down his face carrying his rifle goes back to Marabou uh, barracks where he's challenged firstly by his mates and then by his sergeant. Uh, now the judiciary, you know, when it, the case came to court, the judiciary, you know, really questioned how a man was allowed to leave a barracks carrying a rifle and ammunition, blast away in two locations and go back to the barracks without being challenged at any point by any sentry, by police, nobody. And a man's life had been taken. And also, of course, he questioned the manageress uh, of the NAFE. He said, if you'd have told us it had been burgled in the first place, you know, the night before, then we could have put sent police around, we could have done something. However, Farley was dead. Jennings uh, um, was taken to, to, to court for the crime. Uh, and he was, of course, would be executed uh, in Dorchester in uh, on the 24th of July, 41. He was only 21. 
Um, and there was a couple of issues, really. Uh, there was some controversy about, around he, his execution because the chaplain, who is supposed to hear your last words, actually published those last words in the local newspaper. Mm. Um, and as I won't remember them, and I can certainly uh, read them out uh, for you. Give me a second. Oh, I've got this all sorted. So um, what he said was, during my time in prison, God has forgiven me my sin, and I pray and beseech you to turn at once to the Lord and leave the drink strictly alone, as it has been part of my ruin. And the prison chaplain was totally berated for that uh, and had to make a public apology for his actions. And then uh, subsequently, you know, the controversy continues because the prison uh, was closed uh, in the mid nineties, and the, um, the the church have decided that they're going to hand it over to developers. Um, and, and Andy Saunders kind of gave me some information uh, where the, um, the, the the site is going to be redeveloped into housing. All those that are buried there, those that were actually going to be dug up and reburied someone else. Well, that, of course, means that if you're executed within the prison grounds, it's unconsecrated ground. If you move it to a burial ground, it's consecrated ground, and therefore, suddenly, you're back under the auspice of the CWGC. So what do they do? Do they leave his name on the Brookwood Memorial? Do they take it off and give him a headstone? Or does he get both? You know, so there's controversy behind it. Um, and certainly... You know, um, 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 we, someone said, you know, this is someone's son. Now, in the case of Jennings, his mother uh, wrote a desperate letter to the Home Office. Uh, and in the last paragraph, she said, it has been explained to me that acting on a momentary impulse, a person may win a Victoria Cross and in another, other circumstances commit a crime, as my son has done. I could be proud of his death. If he could die on the field of battle, put him in, in the front line and in points of greatest danger as a soldier, and I will be forever thankful to you. Didn't happen. Yeah, he was executed. So you lost her son. Um, um, but of course, the CWGC uh, recognised him. And that's uh, the, 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 the pictures there you see is the Naffy in Dorchester in 1941. Uh, and the colorized image is uh, inside, which it's difficult to see on the side, but certainly when you look close up, there, there are some fascinating products in there that we still have today. And I was very much so surprised by those. Um, anyway, so if we move on to, uh, to, to the next slide. Just a good, uh, quick question. How much do you think, you know, people are, people, the people who serve their countries in peacetime are saying, how on earth can someone leave a barracks with a 303 rifle? Because in peacetime, you just wouldn't do it. I'm assuming, given that it's 1941, there's a war on, there's a kind of no question, you know, don't ask questions because there's, there's always a possibility that something's going on, it's covert. It's, it's, so I suppose you can get away with more because people are in this sense of careless talk, toss, toss lives. I'm not going to say anything. Is that, is that what you think it is? Possibly, um, the, the, there would be a guard. This is a barracks. There would be a yeah. guard on the gate. Now, he did change out of his boots into plimsolls. Now, whether he sneaked out is not really... You know, the, the paperwork doesn't demonstrate what, how he got out. But he certainly got away. But whoever you are, whether you're a guard, whether you're a policeman, whether you're a, a local resident, Someone blasting away with a 303 rifle yeah. in two locations is going to be heard. Now, when that same person is carrying the rifle back to the barracks, somebody has got to be alert, surely. But it would appear not because he made it back to the to his billet, still with the rifle and still with the ammunition or some of the ammunition. So it gone completely unchallenged, and the judiciary, you know, really berated the army for for, for that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so we move on to to uh, Annette Pepper, 
um, and uh, who was described by the judge at the time as a light of love. Um, she was married. Uh, she'd married uh, a local elect electrician. Uh, they had a daughter, uh, Valerie. <clears throat> Her husband was conscripted into the army, into the Remi. He went off um, to the island of Crete uh, and was taken prisoner by, by the Germans. Uh, and it would seem that uh, Annette then embarked um, on a career of uh, uh, soldierly love, really, um, she she uh, had many relationships um, with soldiers, uh, particularly Canadians, uh, and she met uh, Gautier, who was one of uh, 11 children. He was married himself. Very quickly, they, they, they formed an intimate relation, um, and... He fell in love with her. He, he did fall head over heels in love with her. Uh, but she had other irons uh, in the fire, really. Uh, one of which was a, a chap called Sergeant William Rendell. And Rendell had been in the UK, been shipped back to Canada for a while. And then he returned to the UK. When he returned to the UK, uh, the first thing he wanted to do was meet up with uh, Annette. Um, he ran into uh, Gautier. There was a little bit of a disagreement over uh, uh, Annette's attentions. And, of course, um, uh, they decided to meet at her house in uh, Marlow Road in Port Slade, Sussex, uh, where they would discuss this. So uh, he, Gautier turned up at the address. Uh, Rendell was there with Annette. Uh, he took Annette into the kitchen. There was an argument. He slapped her in the face as she slapped him back and he stormed out. Now, in the meantime, he'd already taken a 25-pound bring gun from his, uh, from his station uh, and placed it in a field close by to the house. He was now incensed, of course. You know, he went, he fetched the bring gun, he banged on the front door, demanded to be let in. The, the house at the time was being rented to a Canadian soldier and his wife. His wife opened the door, uh, saw Gautier with the Bren gun, slammed the door. He demanded to be let in again or he'll shoot. So he shot the front door up um, and burst in through. He'd, he'd hit Rendell in the ankle. Rendell made a quick exit out of the back door. Uh, and then uh, um, Gautier went into the living room, living room and started calling up the stairs asking Annette to come down. And she said, I'm not coming down because you're going to kill me. He, he promised her he wouldn't. So and as she stepped onto the landing, he shot her in the throat with uh, with the brain gun. And as she tumbled down the stairs, he shot her three more times in the stomach with the brain gun. He then removed the magazine from the brain gun and laid the gun disarmed onto her stomach and walked out. He was promptly, of course, arrested by a local home guard uh, and, and of course he was uh, imprisoned and uh, taken to court. Uh, and if you go to the to the next slide, which uh, I hope no one's going to be offended with, <clears throat> this is the front door that he shot up uh, at, at the time uh, in order to uh, enter the house. And this is the last photograph of Annette Pepper lying dead in the living room at the foot of the stairs where she'd been shot. Uh, the case, of course, came to court. Uh, the Canadian uh, Army supplied a chap called uh, Major Maurice Forger, um, and now he defended a number of Canadian soldiers. He desperately tried to get uh, Gautier off for, you know, with this crime, um, but it wasn't to be, you know, really. He said, look, you know, the British government is being particularly harsh on Canadian soldiers all round when it comes to civil cases like this. The judiciary said, you know, did you shoot Annette? Yes, I did. OK, well, in that case, you're guilty and therefore you will be executed. Uh, but it wasn't always the case. And this, you know, of course, that's, you know, I won't debate individual cases, every case on its own merits. I can't determine why something was and, you know, why someone was 
you know, given a death sentence and someone else was given life imprisonment. But there were many, many cases of murders where men were given imprisonment rather than a death sentence. And in some cases, the charge was changed from murder to manslaughter, either because it was a bit tenuous as to whether it was, it was murder. And in some cases, it certainly is an indication that it was like, you know, get this guy the minimum sentence that you can get. We need him back in the forces because we need him serving in the front line. Yeah, and we can't have all that people banged up in prison. Uh, and there is an element of that, but, but you would read to either A, read the book, please, uh, or B, uh, um, you know, go to National Archives, get out the files and go through them. And I think you'll be A, fascinated and B, horrified and surprised in, as much as I was. Mm. Um, so, you know, uh, and if we move on to the next slide, it's probably one of the more well-known ones because uh, um, Winston Ramsey and after the battle, um, kindly provided me with this this uh, photograph of Iris Dealey. And this, she's an aircraft woman, Iris Dealey. Uh, and this chap is Sir uh, Ernest Kemp, um, who was a private in the Royal Artillery. Um, he's mother was a war widow uh, who had a relationship with a chap called Harmon so he became Ernest uh, Ernest James Harmon Kemp uh, <clears throat> and it, all around you know he, he didn't have the best of life uh, his mother died in October of 1943 from uh, an insect bite on the cheek um, and I think he was there was probably some really difficult circumstances around his life but his military record was pretty poor um, and he liked to parade around and he was brought before a field general court martial for wearing the emblems of the captain. Uh, he liked to uh, parade in all sorts of uniforms and in this one you will see that he is wearing cap badge of the physical, the army physical training corps, <clears throat> glider pilot's wings, the military medal and he's also wearing um, some um, Boer War medals uh, and Great War medals, and that was really his downfall, because uh, he on the 14th, you know, 14th of February 1944, Iris Dealey was a seen her boyfriend William Quill, a uh, pilot officer. Uh, she'd seen him off at Waterloo Station. She was making her way back to Kidbrook, where she was uh, stationed at the Balloon Centre, um, and she missed her last train. Um, due to uh, a, a, an air raid. She missed her last connection. She decided to walk the last bit home. She met up with two people who were walking in the same direction, so she felt a bit comfortable about that. And then all of a sudden, they were joined by Kemp. Uh, and this whole conversation went on. And they, uh, then the two, the couple, a brother and sister, uh, went their own way. And uh, Kemp said, oh, so right, I'll see this young lady back to her barracks, uh, which he did then some 400 yards from, from Kidbrook, um, he tried to kiss her. Uh, she wasn't having any of it. It was a struggle. Um, forced her into the cabbage patch by Wellhall Station, Eltham Station, um, where he grabbed her, her scarf and choked her to death uh, in the cabbage patch. It was known as the cabbage patch murder. Uh, he was... Um, well, first of all, uh, um, when her body was found, uh, he'd taken her ID disks and thrown them into a ditch. Fortunately, they were found by uh, a 13-year-old schoolboy. And when the great uh, detective Ted Greeno uh, was involved, um, he soon thought this was been done by a soldier. He believed it may have been done by a deserter. He was like, good grief, you know, this is, although he didn't know D-Day was going to occur, clearly this is just a few months before D-Day. The southeast of England is saturated with soldiers. Mm. And I, you know, this looks like a soldier has done this. Um, however, what happened was Kemp had a ticket for a locker at Waterloo Station in the, uh, on his person that they found. Uh, they opened the locker and they found some articles that belonged to Iris in there and also a, um, a ration book in the name of William Quill, her boyfriend. Um, so, you know, 
Greeno said, I've got my man. Uh, and Kemp said, hands up. Um, yeah. He was sentenced to death. He appealed against the case. And, and of course, he lost. And he was executed at Wandsworth Prison on D-Day on the 6th of June, 1944. Uh, and he's commemorated, of course, on the Brookwood Memorial. Um, Iris is buried in Wanstead in East London. Um, and she's in an isolated grave, probably doesn't receive very many visitors, whereas the Brook Brookwood Memorial receives visitors every day, to, to, uh, to my knowledge. Yeah. And so, uh, and as you can see, she was a lovely, lovely looking lady. Yeah. Mm. Uh, yeah. Yeah, a tragic, an unnecessary loss, really. So, Paul, if we switch uh, this, unfortunately, is the last photograph anybody ever saw of Iris in the cabbage patch uh, following her murder and covered up by her, her own grey coat. Wow. Um, yeah. Tragic. We won't, we won't dwell on that. We'll go on to the... Yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, uh, a number of uh, individuals who are on the uh, Brooklyn Memorial uh, committed the, the civil crime of murder and were court-martialed uh, for the, their crimes. And these involve mainly um, Palestinian soldiers um, whose names... No one can explain to me. That I've asked the CWGC. <clears throat> they've said that you know, it's to do with the timeline. These men committed their crimes in North Africa. Um, they were executed in North Africa, but their names are recorded on the Brookwood Memorial. And I couldn't understand why they were, why aren't they on the El Alamein Memorial? There are some murderers on the El, El Alamein Memorial. Why not put these in there? Oh, they're outside of the timeline. Okay. Basically, we weren't sure where to put them, so we stuck them on a memorial in Surrey. Yeah, which is a bit bizarre. And if you go to the next slide, um, this is the only man who's not a murderer, although he, he was convicted of treachery. Uh, this is Theodore Teddy Church. Um, and to be honest, when I was investigating him and you know writing the story, I was slightly warm to him because he was a bit of a numpty, really. Um, <laughs> And he pretended to be a, um, a, a um, an officer. He was held in. You know, he, he, he was a fascist. He'd worked in uh, a Middlesex uh, business known as the Lanskay uh, Glass Safety Glass Company, um, and it was here that he met um, a, a lady called Irene Page. Now he said that she used to come to work wearing on a Saturday wearing a black shirt and she introduced him to the fascist movement to Mosley's movement um and so when they um he was contacted or, uh and, and and when he said look i'd like to do something for the fascist movement he was contacted and it was suggested that he join the army this was in 1937 so he joined the army he got himself a posting to Palestine, where he was on General Wavell's staff. He was general, one of General, or one of them amongst the drivers, Paul, who drove General Wavell. Mm. From there, he started to sort of ask questions about from different drivers, and he would ask questions around, and then he would pass this information, whatever he got, back to the Italians you know, to start off with. Um, so eventually it was decided that, you know, we're going to get this guy. We're going to, he had to cross the uh, the, the British lines uh, in 1942. He had to cross the British lines, joined the Italians, uh, was said, that we said to him, we're going to put you in a prison camp where we want you to get information from the prisoners. He pretended to be uh, a, a captain, uh, John Richards. And... Uh, um, but he was found out almost straight away because he had this terribly broad Cockney accent, apparently, that was a dead giveaway for many soldiers and officers who said, this guy is just a stool pigeon. You know, he's not Captain John Richards at all. Um, he was put in with David Sterling, 
um, to try and uh, get information from him. Sterling said he, he, you know, sussed him straight away. There's some evidence in the records that suggests that maybe Sterling didn't quite suss him straight away because he, he told him who the second command, uh, second in command was of the SAS at the time. Um, but, you know, the, as the war progressed, he was moved from camp to camp. Uh, one of the uh, men that he was put in with was a chap called Private John Bowman, who, uh, who served with the SAS who'd served with Church and recognised him straight away. and said, oh, you were Church. No, 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 I'm not. And he got himself removed from the camp pretty sharpish. Um, so generally, you know, he, 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 yeah, but he went around trying to gather information and was successful in gathering information. When the Italians sur uh, surrendered uh, in 1943, he, he then sold to work for the Germans. He had a great time. He had lots of money. He met lots of high-ranking people. He had quite a good life, really. Uh, but as the war drew to an end, uh, he was at the La Spazia in, in, in Italy uh, and the Allies arrived. So he tried to, to tell them that he was an escaped prisoner of war and that, you know, he'd do everything he could to help them. Uh, but the Americans uh, quickly sussed him uh, and found out that uh, exactly who he was. He was brought back to the UK um, where, of course, he was court-martialed for treachery, uh, and then he was executed uh, for his crimes. But in my view, and I think I've said it in the book, you know, if the information he supplied cost the life of one Allied soldier, then, in my eyes, uh, he's a murderer. And uh, um, yeah. this the photograph you see on, on the right is the one that everybody sees of him, and the one on the left is one that uh, was kindly supplied to me by the church family, uh, Showing him is just a normal no kid. Two year old kid. Executed the day after William Joyce was executed by Albert Pierpoint. So, and Joyce for treason, him for treachery. And, uh, and we'd have to bring a, a lawyer on to explain when, when treason becomes treason, treachery, and, the, and the, the legal reasons why these different languages. Yeah, yeah. By the way, if you download his certificate from oh, any of these people on the, the Brookwood Memorial, I just, I just did while you were talking, if you download his certificate, it says, Royal Army Service Corps, blah, 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 remembered with honour, it says. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's where there you are. So if we go on to the next slide, um, uh, so, so, so briefly, uh, and I've, I included this, the, the guy in the middle really is uh, Henry, General Henry Maitland. Now, he was the confirming officer for many of the executions uh, in the 21st Army Group during uh, the 1942-43. And the guy on the, the, the right, uh, sorry, on the left, uh, Corporal Salami. Now, Salami was involved in a, a murder for which one of his comrades was actually executed. He may have actually been the murderer. Uh, and the chap on the right is uh, uh, Major General uh, uh, Richard Bassett, known as Ram Bassett because he was Richard uh, R A M Bassett. Uh, you know, a professional soldier, got the military cross, and he was his responsibility uh, to set up uh, court martials uh, in uh, in his area. Uh, and there, um, there were several um, Palestinians who were tried now not unsurprisingly the court papers uh you know for many of the trials of british soldiers are you know this thick you know, and for the palestinians you know you've got a few pages which really you know and you need to read the story lots of it around the hashish trade which you know, i wasn't really aware of um but you know hashish was was being used by the palestinians all the time it was cheap in Palestine, expensive in Egypt. And so, of course, a trade you know, was generated, bringing hashish from Palestine. Mm -hmm. And, of course, that then involved criminals, it involved you know, crime warfare. And, of course, men were murdered um, by Palestinians who were often serving in the British forces. Um, mm -hmm. So, of course, they were, they were executed for their crimes. One of them uh, was called uh, Hassan Medlish. And the, the file, they missed 
recorded his name as Midledge, and he remained as Midledge throughout the whole court session. You know, they couldn't even get his name right, and then they take him, you know, outside and execute him. You know, you mis mistreatment really of um, foreign soldiers, in my personal opinion. So if you uh, pop to the next slide, Paul, I'm not sure that your readers can, your viewers can read all of this, uh, but this is just some of the papers that you'll find in the National Archives. And you'll see these soldiers with their ranks. They're all, there's no officers there, surprisingly. Um, and uh, you'll see that each man was, um, his offence was a civil crime of murder, uh, and that they were either hanged or they were shot. And as you can see on the far right, it says shot, 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 shot. And I was, when I discovered this document, completely surprised and shocked, really, at just how prevalent it was. And so as a consequence, did a little bit more of an investigation. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see um, that, well, first of all, this, these are the signatures that are of uh, Henry Maitland, as you can see, the confirming officer on all of these executions. Uh, and that's a photograph of him, Jumbo Maitland, he was known as. Um, um, and that's a, a photograph of him next to Churchill. And of course, Eisenhower. And Eisenhower was the confirming officer for any member of the US forces who was executed in the ETO. Um, so, um, and Maitland is the confirming officer. But all these men, you know, were, fantastic memoirs and diaries, etc. very rarely make any comment about the men that they signed on, a death warrant on, really. Mm. So if you go to the to, to the next slide, this was a real shocker for me. Yeah. So the Second World War lasted 2,194 days. Now, these are district court marshals and field general court marshals and you'll see that throughout the period of the second world war there were 210,000 court marshals and this is not men being brought before their commanding officer these are men being brought before a court martial which needs to be instigated needs to be created officers mm. need to be provided for the court martial it averages out at 95 a day yeah the gobbling up resource was, must have been phenomenal. And you'll see right at the bottom of this listing, miscellaneous civil offences. That includes murder uh, and rape. And you'll see on the far right, 6,000 cases. Now, of course, not all murders, not all rapes. But in there, there are quite a number of murders, rapes and civil offences for which uh, men were uh, tried and either imprisoned or executed. And um, one of the biggest ones, of course, uh, you've got 30,000 cases of desertion uh, for which the individual came before uh, a, you know, a court martial, either district or field general court martial. But then this is my issue with CWGC. They say they absolutely record anybody who was serving, you know, irrespective of how they died, but not in the case of deserters. In the case of deserters, they specifically decide if someone is going to be memorialised or not. And a, a case in question of that for me is Quartermaster Sergeant uh, Horace Styler, military medal winner, won the military medal in Palestine. Uh, he came from Bedford. Um, and he was found uh, in Lincolnshire, uh, on the River Welland. Uh, he shot himself in the head. His wife said he'd been suffering from depression. He'd been on leave. He'd been, because he hadn't returned, he was classed as a deserter. Now, he'd, he'd gone, no one knows how he got to the River Welland, but he committed him, he killed himself there. He was there for six weeks. During that time, he was... The, uh, class him as a deserter and as a consequence the CWG decided he would not be memorialised so he's buried with no commemoration whereas if you're a deserter and you're killed in an air raid 
you'll find that there's paperwork within the CWGC's own archives that says, yes, we're going to give this man. You know, he was a deserter. He got killed in an air raid. It wasn't really his fault. Well, here's a soldier who killed himself. He got depression. He'd become a deserter because he'd been lying dead for six weeks and you're not going to commemorate him. But that's probably for the future. Really. Yeah, I mean, it's it's just fascinating. I mean, we started with that conversation about the fact that you know, that there this precedent about the uniforms being the weird situations, whether they were you know treated as being in the military or not. And then, as you said, because desertion, it's opening up the whole thing about PTSD, and you could have a guy who's been serving his country brilliantly and then loses it on a particular moment, <coughs> and, and 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 does a runner. But the cases you've talked about in terms of murder, that's these are pretty premeditated, pretty, you can't accidentally murder someone with a Bren gun, really. I mean, <coughs> the fact that these guys are memorialized alongside, as you said, SOE agents and, and other brave people, it's, it's a bit odd. <coughs> yes, and of course, as I think I said at the beginning, sometimes it's alcohol driven, you know, and there's all sorts of things, really. They make fantastic miniseries, I think, because you've got lust and jealousy you know, robbery and, you know, sex-driven cases. Um, you know, we're, there were homosexual cases where you go, homosexuality was a crime in itself, you know. Yeah. And of course, the, there were incidents of that in which, you know, somebody really didn't, was innocent enough not to realise what was going on and suddenly, you know, no, I don't like this, and, and committing a murder. And, of course... These men are the men that were memorialised on the book with memorial. There are many others who were imprisoned or, or those who are overseas or were buried elsewhere or their names are recorded elsewhere. So this, is, this isn't, you know, although this is a small grouping for the book and those that are on the book with memorial, you know, it's not the be all and end all. There are many, many, many more. Um, and you know, they make, in my eyes, absolutely fascinating aspects of both military and social history but you know for me it's the military history part yeah uh, that i find the most fascinating now brilliant stuff we'll move to your last slide and, and we'll answer questions but it's reminding me of that old phrase life isn't fair you know that the thing is you know we can as we depend endlessly which general got the decisions right in market garden or could we have done this or was the strategic bombing of this country worthwhile or not worthwhile the, the the war was being won with a system that clearly is has a weakness. There 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 are people being memorialised who probably shouldn't have been, and there are people who are not being memorialised who should be. And that that is comes down to that great banner of life not being fair. And what you've done is shed a high uh, shed a spotlight on some of these cases that you can just go hmm. That and also, you know, you, what, what I would say at that point is is you're absolutely right. Life isn't fair. There are other victims. Four of these women were pregnant. One of them mm -hmm. was in her, was eight and a half months pregnant when she was murdered by a Canadian. You're going to have to read the book for the whole story. However, you know, so four of these women, you know, two of them had to, you know, had to have a, the, the child was still born. So there's another victim. Mm -hmm. It's not even recorded. Didn't even get the opportunity to 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 have life or have to be given a name, so we've got more victims. Yeah, um, yeah, a, 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 real, a real sand case. And then, of course, in, in one of them, um, one of the cases, uh, grossly, his son. He had a son, you know, well, with his uh, um, common law wife, even though he was married. So bigamy was something that was raging during the Second World War. And people don't often touch on that. Uh, they had a son, and then they, you know, she, her dying wish was that the son would be raised in Wales, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, her home country. He wanted the child raised in uh, uh, Canada, and the night or the day before he was executed, he got a message to say that on VE Day, his son had been accidentally drowned uh, in a play park in, in in Wales, uh, two years old. Was oh. he another victim? Well, you know, but yeah, they're really tragic cases, a, a lot of them, but fascinating and definitely part of our warty 
uh, history. Well, it's the, yeah, and again, it's that, that, that his, studying history at any kind of level of seriousness, it gets complicated. You know, there's a cursory way of looking at it and going, oh, it's very simple. But the minute you start going into the kind of depth you have, of course, new, the, the nuance that we're looking for perhaps isn't there. So you realize that why isn't this? And as you know, this is a good show on World War II TV, raises as many questions as it answers. And this is raising questions about the, the system, the, how it works. And again, I'm going to echo what you said. The Commonwealth War Graves Commission is one of the things I'm most proud of as a Brit, as should be Australians and New Zealanders. And it's it's up there as an amazing body that does incredible work. You know, I seem to never go to a cemetery in Normandy without there being gardeners there working. So I'm never going to say anything negative about the organisation. And yet... A system was in place where people can be memorialized who probably don't deserve it. And and that's I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave it at that, really. Yeah, yeah with, no, and I totally would agree <coughs> with that sentiment, Paul. Yeah, we've got a question about from Andreas there about the last um the figures seeming to go up as the war goes on. Uh, Andreas made the point that you look in yep. sort of 41 foot. Do we have any explanation as to why the figures are going up when things are going better for the country? Uh, well, we're recruiting more people, more, more, more people, soldiers. Yeah. 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 So the armed forces more and more. And this, of course, this is British Army other ranks. Doesn't include the Royal Navy, doesn't include the Royal Air Force, all the voluntary services. So you can add on, and I don't have any figures for that. So 210,000 is just for the British Army other ranks. You've got officers, everybody else. When, once you start looking into it, you will establish, I think, or will hopefully establish some sort of figure in the end, right? Hundreds of thousands of court martials taking place. So there were hundreds taking place every day and gobbling up all this resource, you know, and for, mm. you, know, you know, some, of course, you know, for, for, perhaps we would return as ridiculous crimes. The military wouldn't obviously say that. Um, but there we are, and this is the government evidence. So, you know, yeah, you can I, I find it in the national archives. In 1939 40, you've got more professional soldiers, territorials. And as we get to 44, 45, it's not that we're scraping the bottom of the barrel so, as such, but we're using a wider variety of ages. People are coming in, and, and maybe the training perhaps is being a bit shortened and, and the more oddballs are getting through as the war goes on, I guess. And as I say, just sheer maths, it's more, there's more people in, so there's more murderers. But we have a question from um, Ian Carr. Then we'll, we'll do a couple of questions, then we'll bring it to So Ian is saying, you said at the beginning that you found some of the, the records were misfiled. You found them when you weren't looking for. Is how He's asking you to sort of elaborate on that story. What were you looking for? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that. Yeah. Certainly, I was looking for, um, in the MEPO, the Metropolitan Police Records, uh, held in the National Archives. And in amongst those was uh, files for a chap uh, named Frederick Codling. He's the only member of the Royal Air Force to be executed, shot uh, during the Second World War. Uh, and of course, it was like, wow, what's this? Um, and so, of course, you know, Codling's story is, you know, a whole nother TV show, I should think, really. But, you know, in a real nutshell, he, he, he shouldn't have been um, executed because he shot his commanding officer very, very quickly. His commanding officer didn't, well, although he died from his wounds, actually he died from being a very, very bad-tempered patient in hospital. Mm. That's, you know, and as a, as a consequence, Codling was, was executed. Right. We'll do a couple more questions then. We'll, 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 we'll do that. So Colin is asking, do we have figures for the officers or did the old boy network close that down? Ah, well, you know, obviously the National Archives, um, their, their files uh, are weeded extensively or because they, before they get past the National Archives, they're, they're held by them, the uh, War Office or Ministry of Defence. They get weeded constantly, certainly between the end of the war and when they're transferred to National Archives. And so, you know, I don't doubt that some files have been removed there must be something somewhere and hopefully at some point we can find it because so uh, it's no good bandying figures around until you've got something official in front of you really mm. and i get and, and people about connecting with that people asking you about whether you looked at the figures 
for the for the Commonwealth and or American forces. I guess for the purpose of this book, you stuck with 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 the the, the cases that you were dealing with. But I guess there are figures in existence for the New Zealand forces and Australian and kind of Canadian. It just did you ever look at? Are they 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 won't, they won't be in the national archives. They'll be in their respective countries' archives. I guess. No, no. I mean, yeah. you get, yes. That's uh, something else. The Australians are very proud of the fact that they never executed any of their men. That's because they left it to us, uh, the British, to do. So there were uh, executions of Australian soldiers by by the British, not by the Australians. Um, as for New Zealanders, I'm not sure is the honest answer. Um, but, of course, I'm forever researching. Uh, of course, with the Americans, as you may well know, in the... ETO, the European Theatre of Operations, and the Mediterranean Theatre of Operations, 96 men were executed for a murder and rape. 80%, of course, were black. Yeah. Um, and many, many, many of their men were given life sentences rather than be executed. They were sent back to the US to serve their, their uh, time. But of course, with good behaviour, they were quite often weren't in prison for a very long time. In the meantime, they'd murdered British soldiers, British officers, uh, members of the ATS, um, and all of that, I hope, will be in future books. Good. And and I think you kind of half addressed this at the beginning, but Ian Carr is saying we're talking about these killers being British Army, but there are other similar recorded tales for the Royal Air Force, Royal Navy, Merchant Navy, uh, other, other, other organisations, I guess. Yes, there, there there are, um, but of course, you know they they, they were tried as um, civilian. Oh, sorry, they were executed as civilians, uh, and so they they're not memorialised. But the National Archives holds those records, uh, so you can see them for other services. You know, and of course, you know that includes the Australians, and there's one there for a very notorious crime committed on HMS Australia where two men murdered another man, uh, the whole of the trial, the whole, all the focus was on the fact that these men had been sentenced to death by a British commander, not an Australian. They, what they, you know, and it was all about the politics of the court. When in actual fact, the, you know, no one really wanted to focus on the real reason, which was this was a homosexual killing. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and no one wants to... Nobody wants to touch it. And of course, you know, and I understand it. Lots of historians want to steer away from this subject because they don't want to talk about it. They don't want to talk about sex crimes. They don't want to talk about homosexuality in the forces. It happened. It happened. You know, people died. And why shouldn't we tell that story? You know, we can't just go around, in my opinion, saying, look at this formation, look at that formation, look at this hero, look at that hero. Let's look at them all. No, definitely. I agree. And it, people have been questioning that use. You know, we use these words like the greatest generation hero. And, and, and although we know what those terms mean, it's, it's such a they're such blanket terms. We, it, it, it shouldn't necessarily apply to absolutely everybody. That's that's there. Yeah, there are yeah. bad eggs is how he came back to it. But just one thing I've just this is my question, really. We know that those that were hanged, obviously, there's a there's a set procedure. You know, Alf, uh, Pierpoint was one of the guys involved. But for the ones that were shot, is there a standard way of doing it? Would it be men from the same regiment? Were these people from a from a from how, how was the, the shootings carried out? Quite often, and certainly in the case of Codling, the, the, the um, firing squad was made up from men from his own unit. His own unit. Uh, so, and this would be the case that they would try and uh, use it as a deterrent, of course. And also, and you, you, you would see it on the, the one of the previous slides where I listed um, <clears throat> the names of the, those who were executed. Yeah, we could go um, that one. But yeah. Yeah, if you go back to that one. Where, where is it? Hang on. There That's we it. Go. That so if you read across... The first date is the date of trial. So if you read Codlings, which is right in the middle, AC1, FJ Codling. Yeah? yeah. So he's tried on the 14th of July. Yeah. He's confirmed on the 17th of July. And he's shot on the 21st of July. All right. So there we are. Within a week, a man has been tried, 
Ings death sentence confirmed and executed. Now there's wow. there's a lot going on. First of all, obviously we're invading Sicily. There was questions being raised, I think, from visits from politicians to North Africa, because these men were being uh, tried and executed. You know, and some of these, you know, when you read across, you will see that they were very, very quickly court-martialed, confirmed and executed. And part yeah, of this- Yeah, that was noted earlier how, how swift the whole process was. It was just, you know, these days, I think weeks and weeks before things go to a trial, then weeks and weeks before sentencing, and especially in the States, people can sit on death row, can't they, for for for, yep. for years. So it's, it's it, I guess the war was a different situation, but we will bring things to an end. Um, so, I'll, but I'll just say to you what, what, I, I feel you have more more than a passing interest in it. I can see more books on on other aspect because, as you say, it's bringing together military history and social history and as kind of raising questions. And and it does you know, we have that age old discussion: is there anything more to say about Operation Market Garden or the Dam Busters? Well, with this subject here, there clearly is a lot more to be discovered and a lot more to be said to tell us not only about the war but also about, I guess, society and ourselves. That's right. And for me, obviously, you know, I'm hoping that the book is the gateway, really. It's not a definitive be all and end all uh, to murders, uh, military murders in the Second World War. It's a gateway. It's an, a, an opportunity for people to say, that's interesting. I didn't know about that. I'd like to know a little bit more and perhaps take up their own research and start to look at these cases and perhaps start to go to the CWGC, who we obviously greatly respect, and say to them, you know, is there something we can do? Can we remove these names? Is that possible? What else can be done? And the only answer may be nothing, but this is really setting people off, hopefully setting people off on the path to, to investigating it, you know, to a yeah. much more deeper extent. Yeah, definitely. No, it's, it's, it's opened my eyes. So, folks... Um, as I said at the beginning, the link to buying the book is in the description below. Several people have said they've already ordered it while your lecture was going on. So there's a there's a few sold there. But folks, I'll just remind you what we've got coming up and I'll say goodbye to Paul in a second. So the random show this week. Tomorrow evening, James Fenelon is coming back for his second show about Operation Varsity, which was happening in 1945 this week. So that's a kind of a topical show. Then we have Eric uh, and Jared on Wednesday talking about Ronald Spears, the infamous officer in E Company 506. Lots more stuff coming up. As usual, check out what our listings are on YouTube. Uh, there will be a bit of a break. I'm having a break for, from presenting for a week because I am working as a guide alongside, J alongside James Holland in normally I'm going back to my proper job I suppose I would call it of being a tour guide then in April so the first week of April it all starts up again on World War II TV but again I want to bring back Paul and say thank you very much for having you as a guest it's a it's a it's an absolutely truly fascinating subject and I feel we've we've only opened opened the, the, the door on this there's lots more work to be done so thank you very much for introducing us to this topic and thank you for inviting me it's very much appreciated no, I, I, the pressure was all ours. So there we are. This is Paul Bernard from World War II TV saying I will see you all again tomorrow. Cheers, everybody. Thanks for watching.